Dithka Hadina Pabuni, the Bocasto Mescla Brion Druth, Ostias Genev, Sove Berryman. Hello and welcome everyone to the Mescla Brion Druth podcasts, hosted by me, Sove Berryman. Mescla Brion Druth is a multi platform project using sculpture making and conversation to explore contemporary Cornish cultural identity. Through workshops, podcasts, a symposium, and an exhibition, the project invites people to share their experiences of identity and Cornwall and their views on Cornish culture and its relationship to land, language, heritage, tourism the Cornish diaspora, and much, much more. These podcasts record conversations with guests whose research or lived experience touches on the project themes. The views, thoughts and opinions expressed are the speaker's own. All conversations are carried out with a spirit of generosity and openness, creating space for the discussions to twist and turn. And I'm very grateful to all who have taken part. In this third podcast, Emma Gilberthorpe, Professor of Anthropology at the University of East Anglia, and Dr Hilary Orange, Senior Lecturer in Industrial Heritage at Swansea University, join me to talk about their work and the relationships and impacts of tourism and mining on cultures, communities and landscapes. We join the conversation with Emma introducing her work and research. Um, Yeah, so the projects that I mainly work on are on the impact of extractive industries, um, on social networks mainly, but also economic structures. So I work with Indigenous peoples, mainly in Papua New Guinea, but I've also worked in West Africa, in Guinea, and in Central Africa, in Zambia, and in the Middle East a little bit as well. Um, yeah, so that's that's the main focus of my research, is how large-scale mining and oil and gas extraction uh, impact the way that people interact with each other, uh, not just with each other, from the grassroots perspective, but also with each other in terms of state um, corporations and grassroots interconnections as well. I'm Hilary. Nice to be here. I'm really pleased to be invited to take part in this. Um, Funnily enough, it's it's slightly similar. So I'm an archaeologist by background, but I work more in heritage now. And I work specifically on two things to do with uh, extractive industries. One is um, what happens when sites close down and how those post-industrial sites are are then co-opted, used, disused, uh, and how they become part of community um, action and also inaction. And the second thing is that I'm interested in uh, public perceptions of, of industrial landscape. So my work has been quite various. I, I actually lived in Cornwall for a while when I when I wasn't an archaeologist and I wasn't an academic. I'm not actually from Cornwall and I always take care when I do research to say that I'm not Cornish. But I did live and uh, work down there for nearly a decade. And um, so I've continued to do research on Cornish heritage, on mining heritage, ever since t- about 2005. And then I've done some work on industrial um, tourism in Japan, spent some time out in West Germany, looking at nighttime industrial landscapes and art practice as well. And now I'm at uh, Swansea University in Wales, and um, I'm part of a large transnational research project looking at deindustrialization. It's called DEPO, and that's deindustrialization and the politics of our time. And I think that over time, I, I'm migrating more towards social history. And um, so I tend to integrate different different lumps of literature and disciplinary perspectives. Great. Thank you. I'm interested if I might ask you first off about um, relationships to land and how the presence of extractive industry um, 
sort of impacts that or shifts or changes that? Yeah, um, maybe Emma, if you want to sort of answer that question first. Well, can I just ask you something first? <laughs> yeah. You know, because this is just completely intriguing me since I found out about the project that you're working on and about Cornwall and Cornish culture and Cornish identity. Is the um, self identification of Cornish people as indigenous? Um, not necessarily. No. Um, and there's there's sort of split. Uh, there's there's a you know there's some people who do claim that, and there's others yeah. who don't. Um, personally, I sort of sit in a place of that I think we're far distant from um, indigeneity in like being yeah. indigenous peoples. We're recognised as having an indigenous language and there's... Yeah, I saw that. There's a lot of um, what I have found through my own research and this has been in a sort of, um, sort of anecdotal and what I'd call maybe soft research way um, that um, what... There's a lot of shared experience with, um, with of relationship to land, yeah. relationship to yeah. um, identity, and um, how that sits with tourism and other sort of overarching, yeah. perhaps politics or. Yeah. So that's why I asked you because that's when you asked about the connection to the land. Um, obviously a lot of indigenous people that I work with have a very strong connection to the land but the use of the term indigenous is mm -hmm. really helpful to presenting that identity in a political um, in a political sphere I suppose and from what you've just said that seems to be quite a similar case in Cornwall it, as well I, I would say it is my hesitance around that and sort of um being careful around that identification is that it would be very easy for an awful lot of people in Cornwall to claim that space without acknowledging all the other experiences that they do not share with mm. indigenous nations peoples around yep. the world um, and, and I Absolutely. think that's a really vital yeah. difference yeah yeah it's it's um quite a controversial thing to claim isn't it um and a lot of the the um you know the political conversation around indigeneity and an indigenous people's indigenous capital i um is is very political and it's all about you know claim claiming con claiming um sovereignty or i was going to say ownership which i don't like to use because it's not a concept that is shared by a lot of indigenous people but sovereignty of the land so yeah i can see what i can see what you mean by you know but it struck me because you said that that the cornish language is is actually considered an endangered indigenous language i mean that in itself is 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 interesting sorry i went completely off topic turned the table started asking you questions <laughs> instead of all the way around well no and it's quite it's quite relevant to um like actually that really connects with something Hillary spoken to me about around the identification of the Cornish miner. And I'm interested in the Cornish miners' role, like Cornish diaspora, and being sort of representatives of of yeah, a, co a colonial project and of those extraction industries and you know being part and parcel of that. Because well, where I work in Papua New Guinea, for example, um, a miner wouldn't necessarily have identity to place and identity to land. I'd love to hear what you think about this, Hilary. So the, the notion of community is very separate, or the community itself, the local community, the indigenous peoples who have a connection to the land, to the place, are very separate to the miners and the miners are often conceived as strangers and they actually use the term people whose faces we do not know 
they use that term because they're people who've come from other places and they bring with them their other languages, their other customs and traditions, and they and they also almost the mining places, the mining towns are like a melting pot of all these different languages and cultures and stuff. So the the miners, the mining community are outsiders. Yeah, that's really interesting. This is actually something that I was hoping was going to come up because this this absolutely fascinates me. And um, so my my impression living living in Cornwall, and um, I actually had a flatmate once who said to me in conversation that he thought his blood was different to mine. Wow! Because I was yeah. born in England, and he was. But so I'm aware that there there are people that, very, that feel very yeah. strongly about their ethnicity. I don't remember it ever being expressed with the word indigenous. Um, certainly Cornish, but coming back to the diaspora, of course, there aren't just people who self-identify as Cornish in Cornwall. There's, there's people, diasporic communities around the world because of, of export of, of mining, Cornish mining skill and traditions. And I actually looked up the figures this morning. It's uh, um, This is from the Cornish World Mining World Heritage Site website. They're saying that there's around 6 million people abroad mm. who descend from those... Yeah. Um, a lot of them went to Australia, didn't they? The Cornish that, miners went off to Australia. Yeah, Australia, mm. Australia, Chile, Mexico, North America. Um, I mean, you know, the four corners of the world or however many corners there are. So actually, there could potentially be more people outside mm. Cornwall who self-identify as Cornish than there are in Cornwall. That's an interesting idea. Um, but to me, I always work with the kind of cardiac model that, you know, it, it's people felt they were Cornish. But certainly with the students that I taught who were um, more strongly uh, aware of, of Cornish identity, because not everybody is, it was to do with being born and belonging to place. So I think that the way I see it is you get these kind of um, nested identities that, that people who are born in Cornwall are more likely to feel Cornish than those who aren't. But then you get people who come in. And it's interesting what they tend to do is sometimes they tend to establish a connection to place through finding out about local history and heritage by joining societies, by joining cultural organisations. And um, in the work I did, I, I, I surveyed attitudes to, to landscape, land, and um, to ideas of Cornish identity. And I found that actually, if people had been living in Cornwall, after about 20 years, their perceptions of belonging and place were pretty much sim identical, similar to, to people who'd been born and brought up in Cornwall, as, you know, from, from babies, from children, from young people. And then you get this whole idea of the outsider, which comes back to the the miners, and and that mining is a is a mobile workforce. It's a certainly in the 20th century, it was a multinational, international mm. labour market. So there's something in this for me around um, the ability to other in a situation. So like. In some of my travels, so in the Mollus Hunt Wizards project, when I was in Australia, I was looking at could I find Berryman's, who you know my surname, who who were part of that diaspora, and where where would I find them? And um, I was I did come across Cornish communities who were really fervently, and I, I found this also some years before in New Zealand, who were really fervently Cornish and protective around Cornish land and yet were actually quite dismissive of um, indigenous peoples in those lands and their, their um, guardianship and relationship to that land being different and having, you know, being different to the Cornish diasporas relationship to that land is that it, makes sense do you mean land they were protective of cornish land in cornwall or in yes, australia in cornwall right so they would be really clear about their relationship with cornwall and that piece of land 
but didn't seem to respect the same relationship. Uh, of the indigenous peoples in Australia. Ah, exactly. Okay, that's so interesting. So yeah, that's yeah. where I wonder about this kind of a split, like an mm. othering split mm. to be able to, um, yeah. And, and have you come across that in your research? Hilary, you were about to say something. Well, what I noticed was that I met people who had very long um, knowledge of their own family histories. And I, I met people who were coming back to research their family history. So I think that I met people who could go back literally six, seven generations. Um, I mean, in my family, I'm not even sure we know, know much about my, my great grandparents, not even their names. So I, I do think there's definitely, I noticed that as being uh, quite particular in my time in Cornwall, that kind of idea that you know where you come from, you know who your family, who your families are. But the other thing I think that's really important about Cornwall is that essentially it came across to me as an island. I mean, if it wasn't for those four miles uh, that join Cornwall to Devon, where the River Tamar runs down, then it would be an island. It's a, it's a, maritime, it's a maritime landscape, surrounded by sea, you know, River Tamar, talking about othering, there's Cornwall, there's going up country to Devon, to England, you know, and there's this directionality about that, about that culture and identity. And that directionality isn't just about Cornwall versus England, because that's essentially what, what it is. And there's no way of getting re away from that. It's about, it's about Cornwall and England. And if you go back archaeologically, you, we can also be talking about, you know, Celticism, because that is so much a part of Cornish identity, the fact that Cornwall is one of the Celtic nations. And you see it archaeologically, you see you know, in the in the, the prehistoric and the monolithic cultures, you see so many similarities across the Atlantic seaboard between Ireland and, and Cornwall and Wales and Brittany. So it's there and it's also within the the the, the links between the languages. So I, I often used to say to people, Oh, if you can read Cornish, can you read Welsh and, and vice versa? So and I think there are, I believe there are some, I don't read, I know a few phrases in Cornwall, but I don't read it and I'm not fluent. I never learnt it, but there are many fluent speakers of Cornish now because the language has been revived. But coming back to land, I think the other important thing is about the granite. I know that you're going to be talking to Shelley Trower, who's uh, at Roehampton University, and she's written this wonderful book called Rocks of Nation. And so if we're talking about extractive industries, and so we've got this, we've got this almost island that's fundamentally, you know, it's, it's, it's granite geology is so important to the story of, of those extraction, extractive industries, not just the, the hard rock, but also the china clay. So if we think about Cornwall having this strong identity and mining having become an industry that has really... Um, become entwined with Cornish cultural identity, like not for everyone, but in in a sort of more popular way. How how I suppose in your anthropological anthropological research, Emma, how what do you think about those connections with um, like that other ring we were talking about, or someone having this strong identity? They're not. You know, they're a duchy, they're different, they've got a language, they're a Celtic nation, a strong relationship with land, but then being perhaps part of an extractive industry. Yeah, I suppose, the, I mean, it's very interesting that they are, like Hilary says, an almost island nation. I don't know if nation is the right word, duchy, um, an almost island um, because that does, I mean, particularly in the past, if you're going back to, you know, prehistory and and um, the Celtic traditions, they were isolated pockets of people, weren't they? Because they were isolated by sea, they were isolated by a river, and they were isolated by moors. So there would have been pockets, social pockets of people who would have had an identity to a particular type of landscape whether that landscape was characterised by 
granite or you know clay or it was more land or it was you know the sea whatever it was even before more formal types of mining there was a a, a defined and isolated community wasn't there and that must have had an impact on the sub- subsequent cultures I, I don't actually think it was that isolated um, because you have a tin trade across the, the sea. I mean, I'm, I'm talking, go, I mean, a place like Cambrai, maybe maybe you could say something about Cambrai because the, there was a hill fort up there and the evidence is of, of, of trade, mm. you know, trade of, of, of metal, trade of materials, trade of material culture coming into and out of Cornwall. Um, going back to prehistory, I mean, I'm talking about prehistory here. So, so there's been quite a lot of work done on those trades and of those, those connections between Cornwall and not just England, but, but Cornwall and places across the sea. Um, so I don't think it was that kind of isolation. I think there were people coming in and also people and things going out. Um, but they would they would still retain their identity, wouldn't they? Their cultural identity. Well, I mean, it's in, partic- in terms talk- of material culture as well, probably. Yeah, like the people yeah, yeah. Who, may, who who mine tin, for example, this is where we get our tin from, and we and we exchange X for tin. Yeah, but we don't know exactly. I mean, you know, I mean, there are there are types of um, architecture that that. As I say, you 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 have uh, monolithic architecture architectural types in in Brittany, in Cornwall, in 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 Wales, for example. Or but you have some unusual things in Cornwall that you you might only find in uh, sort of fugus, which are these unusual kind of tunnels. Um, but you have courtyard um, buildings in, say, Wales of Scilly and and in other places in Cornwall that you don't tend to find in other places so there are some differences and there are differences in material culture but I don't think we can say that the people back then thought they were Cornish because there isn't even anything to say that 17th uh, 18th century miners thought they were Cornish um, from what I I can gather looking at the the history Cornishness is actually quite a modern idea um, that even if you go back into the 19th century you're not really going to come across references to to that kind of concept of Cornish identity. Yeah, I mean, this is where it gets slightly messy, doesn't it? Because I would never, ever want to, I would never want to um, suggest that I'm trying to um, eradicate people's sense of identity. But when it comes down to um, the history, it's actually it's actually fairly clear. It's all connected, actually, with the decline of the industries. So Philip Payton and Bernard Deacon have written about this. They're two social historians based in Cornwall and other people have written about this as well. And so at the end of the 19th century when the mining industry was in decline and there's this mass exodus of Cornish families going off abroad to, to seek, you know, to seek work um, because things really were so dire. And interestingly, in doing that, they actually, in a way, accelerated the, the decline of the home industry because they took their skill and technology to other places and built up mining elsewhere that then ended up competing. But at the end of the 19th century, there was the, this emergence of this uh, revivalist movement. And there were concerns amongst the middle classes at the time about the decline of the industry and about the decline of Cornwall. And um, tourism was actually seen as an economic panacea. It was seen as a, as a, a way to solve this economic problem. And so the revivalist movement and, and the middle classes, you know, the shopkeepers, the, the great and good of the land came together and they started to revive these old aspects of Cornwall to collect these kind of archaic and ancient fragments. Um, and part of that was the old Cornwall Society that was founded, but also that led into the establishment of um, the, the, the Gorseth, the Bard, the Bardic 
Gorsef. And um, but but tourism was was pretty much there on the agenda. It's kind of you know. And then because of the rise of the motor car and the leisure industry, we get to the to the mid twentieth century and 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 get get past the Second World War. And by by the nineteen sixties, seventies, eighties, there are real concerns about how Cornwall is changing. Well, it's quite interesting because this is almost identical to what is happening in places like Papua New Guinea at the moment with mine closures. You know, not just Papua New Guinea, there's lots of places where people have been mining and, and the mines are closing and they're looking for that something that, that that will replace it. What is it that will keep communities there in um, connected to the land what will allow the communities who live in those places to continue to have electricity to continue to have running water all these resources which have been provided by mining companies what will what will allow i mean the the, the local people want it as much as well probably more than anyone else because they're used to the resources that have come with mining and the people it brings as well as electricity and things like that and tourism is very much being um, presented as the answer to post mining contexts and it's a very different type of to, of tourism of course in in png and and other places as well you know it's 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 bird watching and you know the kind of indigenous experience which you you know a lot of um talking about middle classes a lot of the middle class um uh, desire to to have that kind of otherworldly experience and to and to go somewhere and experience um, a different way of life and to and, and the selling of culture that's what it that's what it is across the world in 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 not just in um, old mining communities but also just in 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 places where conservation and things like that are being promoted as as new places for tourists. And have you seen, have you come across or are there examples of places that are like post-tourism? Yeah, not anywhere where I've worked. Everywhere that I'm working at the moment is in that phase of, of coming towards the end of mining and what happens when mining goes, what's, what do we do? It's almost that panic phase of what happens next, what's going to happen when everything goes, when the electricity goes and the water goes. So it's it's that real desire at the moment to keep those things um, and the, the kind of things that make people's lives better, like running water and like electricity and like hospitals, having a hospital nearby, which is only there at the moment because there's a mine there. So I think that's a very different situation for uh, than Cornwall. But I imagine that Cornwall, I mean, the tourist industry, like you were saying, Hilary, that started, it was quite a long time ago, wasn't it? Many many decades ago so for the generations who've lived with it um it becomes a different narrative doesn't it, it becomes a different experience um and it pushes the prices up like you say and it becomes the the people who would have um yeah. advocated for it decades ago would never have, have imagined what it could what it could create and that it would push prices up in the way that it has. And that statistic yeah. that you provided survey, that was incredible. The statistic that the number of homeless yeah. people is equivalent to the number of holiday homes, which is just oh, quite devastating. Yes, that was, I can't, I'll, I'll share a link on the resource page for the um, project for that. Um, now recently post COVID, I mean, um, there's been a, a just massive COVID exodus to Cornwall. It really, it it, it it really is a huge problem. Yeah, I mean, I've I've noticed it since I was living there, and and also the influence of the TV. So we have the kind of a the pole dark phase <laughs> of, of masses of people going down to Cornwall because they've been watching it on pole dark that really romanticised kind of hero minor narrative following the, the 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 Winston Graham novels from the 1950s also Rosamund Pilcher has written on Cornwall so that's another way that it's been popularized through literature but now it seems like because of lockdowns and people 
holiday in at home rather than overseas everybody I know seems to go down to Cornwall on holiday it seems to me that it's it's tourist season all year round um and during the covid um sort of era um there there was a lot of people hearing hearing from people saying yeah we're not, we're not social distancing we're on holiday we've not, we've come down to get away from that or making complaints that bars are shut um, because people have got COVID. There was a massive lack of respect for the fact that this is somewhere that people live and work um, and for the fact that we've got really reduced um, facilities, hospital facilities. You know, it's really common that you have to go over the Tamar to get medical treatment. Um, so um, I think if like, that that's part of that kind of brain split that I'm interested in that sort of happens with this possibility of othering something oh I'm in this I'm in this guise now I'm I'm a tourist I might be a really caring um I don't know a, a really caring empathetic individual otherwise but now I'm on holiday <laughs> and I wonder if that's like a shared like, I'm interested if, if that's a similar experience to the minor. I really care, you know, the, I really care about my land at home and about my relationship to my land. But now I've travelled overseas and I'm, I'm at work. And it's a different relationship. Yeah, I don't think there was sentimentality about lands and about mining. I mean, what I find fascinating about the mines is that a lot of mining heritage now just looks at the surface. You know, it's just connected with engine houses and chimneys and, and these pointy things in the landscape. And the surface tends to get overlooked. But then, then because so much of the subsurface has now been closed off, the mine shafts are being grilled and collared and capped for safety reasons, which is understandable. You no longer get that kind of breathing landscape that you used to get where because of the different temperatures from below to above ground, you'd actually get this kind of breathing. I, I'm talking literally um, sort of vapor, vapors coming out of the landscape. So, so I find the whole embodiment of landscape around mining also really interesting, the way people talk about it and connect to the underground. And that, that is basically lost. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a mining landscape that's essentially being closed, closed at surface. But... My understanding, and Craddock Peters has talked about this, because of the influence of Methodism on, on Cornish religion, that the land was just basically seen as a commodity. It was there to be worked. And the Methodists, so Wesleyans, actually tried to get rid of a lot of Cornish folklore and, and persuade people away from those kind of older traditions and, and put them on the road to, to, to goodness and, you know, don't drink, don't misbehave, don't don't believe in all these kind of uh, magical creatures. And, and the land was a commodity. It was just there to be used. It was there to be worked. So that's, that's why I think that when mines close down, it's very common for, for the valuable stuff to be moved, you know, the engine to be moved, for, uh, for the buildings to be robbed of usable materials. But then what you see, particularly in the 60s and 70s, before municipal waste um, sites are opened, the mining land was used, A, by children to play in, and B, as places to dump rubbish. And that wasn't a lack of care. That was just a continuation of, of land needs to be useful. It, it, it needs to be productive. And if it's not going to be productive for extraction, it can be a productive place where I can take my Volvo or my old fridge. And I can mine shafts are really handy if you want to get rid of dead livestock or you know or polluting materials or large household objects and so so that sentimentality I actually think is it wasn't there and and the sent sentimentality around the idea of heritage I mean heritage is is quite a new thing it came in during the sort of the, the Thatcher government the heritage industry emerged through Thatcherism and Thatcher policies connected with nation nationalism and so that's a new, that's a recent thing. And so 
old new mining always got rid of the old mining so um that's it's it's interesting some of those things that you say obviously from your research perspective i mean i concur um people did used to throw rubbish down mine shafts um and i was born in the early 70s so I uh, and people used to disappear down mine shafts quite regularly, and I played around countless mine workings like that was just normal. But my family's um, so co- have other parts of my sort of ethnicity or heritage, but my Cornish family's on both sides, and absolutely always spoken about by parental and. Um, my parents aren't that into Cornwall, but parental and grandparents always spoke about where we're from for, for hundreds of years back. And we'd talk about, say, relatives who might have died generations before are spoken about as though they're present and um, the place that you're from historically sort of spoken about as almost like it's present that's where you're from so I'm at this I'm interested in some of these ways that we talk about land is um I can see some of that sentimentality around it definitely being a fabrication but I think um there's something else that's perhaps a scene that's been that's run through Emma yeah I was thinking that it's pro- it's probably a bigger British cultural issue from what from what you're saying because um, and this has been completely exacerbated by COVID but just the fact that a lot of British culture a lot of British societies um, commoditize the landscape and they would see, I mean, t- tourism is a commodity, right? And if you go to Cornwall on your holiday, that land, the heritage, is an, a commodity. And that's something that British culture has become, isn't it, over time? Because we've been isolated since the Thatcher government. We've been isolated into smaller and smaller boxes piled on top of each other in flats or whatever it may be. So that sense of community that you're just talking about there in relation to your grandparents' survey is very, very different to most British people's experience of culture. It's very isolated, even pre-COVID, very isolated, no sense of community. You only have to watch these um, home shows, you know, location, 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 whatever, escape to the country, that's a good one, where everybody who goes on, it says, we don't want neighbours, we don't want to be overlooked, we don't want to have people around us. And, you, and like, as an anthropologist, I'm just sitting there going, really? You don't want to be around people? It's the most bizarre thing. But you see that more and more. And this has been completely exacerbated by COVID. But somewhere like Cornwall, for whatever reason, whether it be geographical um, or geological, they seem to have maintained this sense of community and this sense of belonging that that has a generational past, which many people can't, like we said earlier, many people can't say even what their grandparents were. But you, but as you're talking, you're saying that your grandparents, you you can trace your Cornish history back generations, which is very very unusual. And 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 Cornwall has somehow been able to maintain that sociality that everywhere be not everywhere beyond. I don't want to, you know put a broad brush stroke on this but it's very very common now across Britain that that sense of sociality has gone and that's where I'm interested in the landscape relationship to that I mean the actual um, ease to traverse aspects of the landscape the edges of it where the water is um, like 
Yeah. Well, maybe that's easier to move around Cornwall as well. I mean, if you come from London, if you've got your second home in Cornwall, but your base is in London, that movement around the landscape isn't quite as fluid, is it, as it perhaps is in, in Cornwall. And, and the movement that you make, the pathways that you traverse, don't have any heritage any connection to you as an individual you couldn't say oh my grandfather went along this pathway my grandmother climbed that hill you don't have that kind of geo geographical connection which in Cornwall you probably do that's what connects people to place because they say my grandfather passed along this path my mother came along this path my my grandfather sat at that rock my great great grandfather um uh, or my brother drowned in that river. You may, it may be quite a tragic past, but there's something has a meaning to everyone. And if you're surrounded by a landscape where that historical meaning has gone, then that sense of connectivity and that isolation, that social isolation just becomes more and more emphasised. Yeah, I agree. And I think it comes back to to uh, shared culture and tradition. And, and one of those, a dominant one, was, of course, mining. So even though the actual mine workings might have been kind of seen as something to be used, the actual industrial communities were, were you know, this is what you're describing. And this is where those social bonds were. It wasn't just at the mine, which was the heart of the community when it was, when it was living, when it was working, but it was also in the industrial communities. And, and if you look at the World Heritage um, Site, the mining site in the world, Cornwall and West Devon, um, mining landscape world heritage site is its long name um, there's something like 80,000 people reside in that uh, UNESCO inscribed world heritage site so it's completely entwined um, it's a connection as well isn't it Hilary so people say my father used to work at that mine or my grandfather used, or my great grandfather that's, yeah, yeah. that's also a connection through the mining itself yeah, it is. It is. But I think there are wider connections. I mean, one thing that I tend to bang on about is is that the um, World Heritage Site, the, the temporal boundaries for this inscription is from 1700 to 1914. And mining really changed in the 20th century, massively reduced in scale. Um, but also the, the Labour demographics change. So in the uh, Second World War, you have the Bevan boys, you also had prisoners of war working in the mines. And then after that, you had a, a much more multinational, international labour force. So one of the things that comes back to Sove's so original point about my work on the Cornish miner is that often the imagery and narrative around the Cornish miner is that, that peak industry, you know, the, the 18th, 19th century, the diasporic um, Cornish miner going abroad is colloquially known as Cousin Jack. But in the 20th century, it's really different. And that that difference doesn't tend to emerge so much in the heritage narratives. In fact, I, I think it's pretty much hidden. Because the miners I talk to, you know, when I kind of try to touch on the subject of identity and ethnicity, they don't care. They're, they're the underground labour force. You know, they're the underground workers. They they're the miners and they it just really matter if you come from Scotland, England, Yorkshire, you know, you're the same. You're you're the same. You're working underground. And and I think that that narrative is completely broken up um, in the 20th century and becomes much more messy, but also much more interesting. because it's much more a story of people coming into Cornwall again, as they always have done. Um, so that concerns me a little bit, to be honest. Um, what, what what concerns you? That that story isn't told. Um, that that story, that twentieth century story, isn't isn't evident in in heritage narratives. So, um, and, and you know, and also you know, you, you you get the kind of rise of Paul Darkism, and and then it's just another kind of uh, resurgence of this 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 more nineteenth you know earlier image. Uh, of a Cornish miner and I think that the you know they're aging the, the miners are aging they're not going to be with us for much more and I think their stories also deserve to be told and so one thing that I've written about and one thing I find fascinating when I go to Giva tin mine is that you look at all the interpretation inside the, the dry which was where the 
the uh, managers' offices were, and also where the miners changed uh, and, and and had their belongings and showered. And all of the interpretation, it doesn't mention Cornish Miner. It's it's all about the workers, the underground workforce. For and a lot of the names are. are redolent of Polish surnames or, or Scottish names or Irish names or Italian names. This is this is this is Cornish mining in in the second half of the 20th century. Um, Polish, Italian, Scottish, English, Welsh. And when mines closed down, of course, miners went abroad, uh, worked on the Channel Tunnel project. Some worked in the Middle East. And you have Camborne School of Mines, which is one of the world's foremost schools of mine, mining and mine engineering. And they take international students and train those students up. And some of those students carry on working in Cornwall. So Cornish mining isn't dead. You know, there are still engineers and there are still people working at South Crofty and people working in the mining industry in Cornwall. It's not dead. And, um, and those people are not necessarily going to self-identify as being Cornish. And I, I think that story is important. I think it ought to be to be told because it it needs to be balanced up. We've now, like, we've been talking about mining in the twentieth century, and then this romanticised mining, and we now have a new wave of mining in Cornwall with lithium, and um, there's. There's always talk about remining copper or tin um, and geothermal activity. Um, so there's a new there's a new wave of, sort of using the land and extracting from the land. Um, yeah, I wonder if either of you have got any thoughts on that or how, how that re might relate to culture or impact culture again. Or, I think it depends on how much of the land the extraction takes up. So something like, but mining is, um, well, it depends on mm -hmm. the type of mining. Again, an open pit mine, of course, is an enormous footprint. Um, you know, you, you see, you can see some mines from space. The, the footprint is that big. And you can see, so the lithium mining in Bolivia, you can see from outer space. You can see the salt flats from outer space, which is, you know, you know, so I think it depends on that, really. I think it depends on the size of the footprint, the impact on the actual landscape. Um, the, the way that communities respond to the, the extraction project itself very much depends on the size of the footprint and, and, of course, then the pollution that comes with it and the other elements of it. So for tourism, I think that's interesting that you refer to tourism as a type of extractive industry survey i love the i love that but it, it, it i mean it has a footprint doesn't it? it has an impact you know not just in terms of inflation commodity inflation but also in terms of pollution um you know other types of impacts but yeah i think that's one of the reasons i refer to it as extraction is simply what i see in my own lifetime how tourism takes from a culture repackages that and reframes it and then not only is that sold to tourists like the target audience but it's also how that culture is sold back to the the um the, pe the people who live in that area the people of that area and that can create a disconnect um from one's own identity uh, and it's and it's you know tourist marketing is very successful marketing. It's it's like it's almost like the equivalent of like sweeties or something, isn't it? It's nice and digestible and it feels good. And I'll have another one, please. Which is a bit like the lithium market. I mean, this right. is being sold. It's being packaged in a way, isn't it? It's been packaged and sold. This is the mm -hmm. this is the answer. This is the type of mining that will get us out of the you know, horrible, mm -hmm. polluted hole that we're in. This is the answer to climate change. It's being packaged in that way. Of course, it's completely untrue. Yeah. 
I think it's also about the things that we we all want. So although we could say we could talk about the pollution, but the other side of it, we're also all consumers, aren't we? We we carry you know the, this idea of lithium being the new battery of a smartphone of the future. Then um, you know we we I try to remind myself that that everybody everything in my study and in my my house in our house is also part of the Anthropocene. So, so it's interesting to me that we're moved from the, the, this is another revolutionary phase, that we're now in the communication revolution, if you believe what people say. And, and so now we're going back to extracting things that we need from the land in order to be able to have this new, this new you know, way of life, this new social system um, based again on technology. So. And I think it goes a little bit back to what we were saying before as well about the distancing of individuals from the experience, I suppose. So we, we're consumers of these commodities, and be that a, a kind of battery for an electric car, which is something that's being really pushed at the moment, electric cars, but just in our computers and in our mobile phones and in our clothes even, and the kind of you know the use of oil in clothes um not to mention the machinery but it's the distancing isn't it of people from that extraction process so people i I keep using london as the example but you know people in london are very distant from the extraction of lithium so the pushing of an electric car is going to as the answer to to um, you know, saving the planet as you drive down to Cornwall to your holiday home is you know, quite appealing because <laughs> they can't see the extraction of the lithium going on. They don't know the kind of social and economic impacts it's having on the indigenous peoples in Bolivia um, and don't really get the, the impact that they're having on the fragmentation of community in Cornwall because they don't experience it for themselves. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely spot on. And you know, when you had um, the women who were breaking up the ore on surface as, as part of the processing, you know, how how much more visible that would have been, been and not just visible, uh, sonically apparent, the sound of mining as well, um, compared to, to what it's like to be like now. I wonder whether people will be able to see anything of a modern lithium mine or how that's going to be. I wonder how how that mine is actually going to be visible to people. And I think that 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 disconnect, particularly for, let's say, the younger generation who may not have uh, ever handled a lump of coal or or, uh, don't ever remember seeing a a chimney smoke, you know, or or a furnace light up at night from an iron and steelworks. For, I think, you're going to get that, you're bound to get that generational shift. And I think that generational shift is already happening. The industrial heritage is, is, is becoming much more associated with, with pollution than it is uh, perhaps with the, the kind of the social lives and the way that industry was meshed within um, place and, and people's lives and people's networks and that sense of community. I'm starting to see that transition now, and I think it's partly generational. And as as the workers die, that 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 is going to be another um, sort of fracture point. But I think I think that tourism could help there. I would like to think that, I mean, the the mines were actually operating for tourism back in the 19th century. You could go down at um, the Vitalik mines. You could actually go underneath the seabed and pay half a guinea. And there are these travellers' accounts of going under, going down and out under the into the submarine mines because it's it's well, the coastal mines are also or can be submarine mines that extend out the, the workings extend out under the seabed for you know one and a half k or whatever. And there are these contemporary accounts of of hearing the boulders on the seabed rumbling over your head. And and it was an early form of uh, mining tourism. And at Giva, even when they were working, and at South Crofty, visitors could go down and experience the underground and, and experience what it was like to be an underground worker. So I don't know. Did you ever do that survey as a as a kid? Did you ever go down the mines as a as a kind of day tripper? Um. When. So Crofty. 
you weren't able I wasn't aware that you were able to do tourist trips there while it was still a working mine when it just closed um, a few years after it closed they started those trips um, when it was a working mine school children were taken oh my lord I used to find it so boring but now I'm really pleased I had that opportunity but back in Back in the day when I was at school, I was so fed up with people talking about mine. I could see mines from a bedroom window. It was like, um, but yeah, it was a, a rare privilege. I'm, re you know, and I've been to Givor as a tourist and seen the beds where um, they would sort the metals, um, and know that I've got the memory of having seen them actually working, not Givor, but at, at Crofty. So um, that's a really important part of my heritage, I suppose. Um, yeah, I think there's something in this around, again, like work, kinds of labour, using hands, um, a disconnect of things, and that's th that connection to class and... Um, like white collar, blue collar work or, um, yeah, wanting to distance, not, not everybody, but there's a sensation of development being distancing oneself from dirt or mess. Yeah, that does make sense. Yeah. And it's almost that um, the worker, the working class built this, the working class. I'm just thinking about it in in Australian terms because you can go to a mine you can visit an old mine in Australia or an old mining town even and it's really nostalgic it's it's presented in a really nostalgic way and you can pan for gold and you know all this kind of thing and it's almost like you know it's so um inappropriate in so many ways but it is very much presented as a this is how we built these are the people who built our country you know in very um disrespectful to the indigenous peoples who of course lived there before it was colonized but that's how it's presented and there is you know that connect that these are the workers these are the people who built this place who, who built the land that we now find ourselves on and it sounds a little bit like that um well i visited silverton and um, broken hill um yeah on um when I visited Australia a while back for Mollus Hunt Wizards and my and that was when I was yeah looking for sort of Berrymans and I found Berrymans in Silverton and um, it really felt to me like it was an exhausted place like yeah the land had really been wrung out yeah and and yeah. and it was and it was a ghost town yeah yeah there's there's a few of them I've never been to that one, but there are place, places like that, very similar, which are ghost towns. And they're presented in that way. So even though people live there, there's an element of it that's been preserved as a ghost town. So that, you know, particularly to give a sense of heritage, this is our heritage. You know, it's a very white, as I said, very white colonial type of heritage, but that's what it's presenting. Mm -hmm. you know, these are the ha these are the men, the hands of the men that built this land. These are the workers. It's that you know that real working, the working man who built this land. That kind of sense, which uh, you know you see in in north northern England as well, northeast in the old mining places there. There's a lot of old collieries up in the Durham district, and you can go to some old mines and have a similar kind of experience. I mean, there's a heritage centre. Can't remember what it's called now, off the top of my head. Um, you know, a very famous heritage centre where you can go and you can go in the old mine. There's a place called Morewell and Quay um, in Cornwall that um, I, w I went there on a merit mark trip from school <laughs> and this is like definitely a tourist destination and you get to go in a really old mine and people are wandering around in Victorian clothing but it's a really sanitised experience. Exactly, yep. And I remember even, like, as a child being like, hmm, I'm, I, I'm not quite sure about this. 
Like... Uh, it's something that used to come up in my research. People were um, afraid of Disneyfication. That used to be the phrase That's used. It. But yeah. you know that that the mining landscape would, would become yeah. Disneyfied or it become theme parked. Yeah. And um, and I, I totally get that. I totally appreciate that. And uh, I once had a a, a very interesting a meeting with uh, a chat we were sat in quite a wild bit of 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 mining landscape a bit of mining landscape that hadn't been tied tidied up much and um he was complaining about the amount of paving stones that were underneath all of these coastal benches you know and he said if you add all these paving stones up it's the entire area of Cornwall is going to be paved over and and he had a good old rant about paving slabs mm. which I thought was quite an interesting insight into surfaces you know tarmac fake fake grass yeah yeah absolutely we, I could carry on um speaking with you both for um so long and ask you more and more questions and I just want to say thank you so much Hilary thank you so much Emma it's been really fascinating speaking with you um, and uh, yeah, thanks for your contribution to my bit of research here. Thanks, Survey, for the invitation. It's been great. Lovely to have a conversation with you both. Yeah, really fascinating. Thanks, Survey. Let's do it again sometime. Yeah. Next project. <laughs> yeah, next project. <laughs> yeah. Mraz, I guess Goslo is. Thank you for listening. Further episodes of the Mescla Bruyon Druis podcast can be found on my website, saveaberryman.co.uk. That's S O V A Y B E R R I M A N.co.uk, where you'll also find guest biographies and a resource page of links to further reading on the topics discussed. If you feel inspired to join the Mesco conversation about contemporary Cornish cultural identity, please get in touch with me, Sove Berryman, via my website or social media. You'll find Mescla Bruyon Druis on Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. The Mescla Bruyon Druis podcast and project has been made possible due to a wealth of in-kind help and support from many parties, including the Wender Perrin Festival, Gorseth Kerno, Cornwall Council's Cornish Language Office, Coethys and Yeath Canuick, Crescent Kerno, Cornwall Neighbourhoods for Change and Falmouth University Falmouth Campus. The project has been supported using public funding by the National Lottery through Arts Council England and further funding has been gratefully received from Historic England by Redreath Unlimited. Agas Termin, Agas Gwellas. Thank you for your time. See you later.